Thank you, Holly. That was beautiful. We're so glad to have you back. When I was a little girl, somehow in our culture, I picked up this idea that God was this supernatural being that was out in the sky, and, and he uh, was somehow separate from me, and that... How do I want to say? You know, he at some times could even um, have control over my life in some way. Doesn't it sound a little bit scary for a child? Yeah, yeah, it does. You know, this is a concept that's even prevalent today in the movies that we that we go see in the theaters and television shows, Netflix. It's a theme that constantly runs through, and. You know, I'm so glad as a little girl that I had my own little conversation going on with God. So somehow I knew that that wasn't right for me, but I did question that if I don't believe what all these other people are believing, then does that mean that I'm atheist? Now, the quick answer to that is no, but certainly that put me on my own path of questioning, and through that I found my way to the five principles. So what I'm talking about today is the five principles, and that's really a basic teachings of unity and what it means. I brought with me the book, it's actually called The Five Principles by Reverend Elvin Devonport, and she wrote this several years ago, and she was really trying to find a concise way to share how the principles are still valid in our world today. Now, I do love the fact that when she starts this book, she dives into what I think is the elephant in the room in Christianity. And that is the fact that a lot of people believe in this theistic God. And she quotes uh, author John Shelby Spong, who's also, also an Episcopal bishop. And he says, the theistic God is seen as a being, supernatural in power, dwelling outside this world, and able to invade the world in miraculous ways to bless, to punish, to accomplish divine will, to answer prayers, and to come to the aid of the frail, powerless human beings. Now when you hear that, doesn't that just make you want to cringe? You know, that is certainly not what I believe, so you'll be glad to hear that the five principles challenge every single aspect of that idea. Okay, so I am so grateful that in my 20s I found my way into a unity church and that as I learned these principles, this is how I started to make sense of spirit and to really understand what it means for me today in my own life. So what I'd like to do is jump right in to principle number one. And principle number one is God is. God is absolute good everywhere present. So with this principle, we are one with God. You know, we're not separated, we're not watched, but we're immersed in the divine like this fish that's on the screen. God is in us and around us, and although we can remain unaware of the sustaining force that exists, for instance, right now, do you think that the fish is aware of the water? It just is. But what happens if it's out on the dock flapping around out of the water and it can't breathe? It would certainly be aware then. I think it's the same for us in our lives. You know, are we swimming in spirit in our life? Are we disconnected and flopping around trying to figure out where we're supposed to go? There's all kinds of verses in the Bible that reference this principle. This is one of my favorite from John 15, 5. It says, I am the, the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I am in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So for thousands of years, people of all faiths have done their best to find the words to describe the unity of the universe. It's the omnipresence of God, the unseen, everywhere, present, moving force in the universe. And I love how Ellen in her books <coughs> talks about how this is everywhere within all religion throughout the world. The Buddhist Suntras envisioned a net stretching in all directions. The Hopi spoke of spider grandmother who spun a great web connecting all things. To the ancient Chinese it was the Tao or flow of the universe. The hymn of creation from the Hindus speaks of the absolute called Brahman and describes it as ultimate, eternal, and beyond human description. This is the ground of being or infinite reality. And we hear the names God, Holy Spirit, the universe, the way, creator, divine, one mind, source, energy, first cause, and thanks to Star Wars, even the force. <laughs> so if you don't understand any of those other concepts, we get the force in our culture today. So God is everywhere. So once we embrace this idea that God is, just like water is, we stop forcing human characteristics onto this concept, such as evil. You know, humans can be misbehave at some times. 
sometimes in big ways, but that does not mean that their root is evil. Humans have free will and are often guided by their own fears instead of by love, which is really what I believe is our divine nature. So Reverend Ellen talks about the fact that the human species is actually immature. The Aramaic word that, becomes, that became evil in the Bible is bisha, which means immature or unripe. Hence, the biblical reference to evil fruit that you might have read about, it wasn't ripe. So, we as humans are immature or unripe, not yet living from that divine consciousness, which I believe is our birthright. So this is why we must develop our own spiritual intelligence, which I think I talk about almost all the time, so that we can act from a place of awareness and love at all times instead of reacting from a place of fear that can take us off into the wrong path. So to help us feel grounded today with these principles, you know, I brought in the singing bowl. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Also, my, the chaplains, Karen and Joanne, have volunteered to help. And at the end of each principle that I talk about, I, they're going to do a little short 30-second prayer-type meditation. Now, you have a choice of keeping your eyes open or closing your eyes, but mostly I want you to feel into the words. You might want to put your hand on your heart and just see if you can feel the vibration of what this principle actually means. So I'm going to start. I enter into the stillness to align myself with the one mind, the one presence that permeates all of creation. I feel myself as a part of this creation, connected to all of nature. I am the light and darkness I am the oceans and the land. I am the rocks and trees, the fish and birds, the beasts of the earth, and I am one with every human being on the planet. In this oneness, I sense the order of all things. I feel the divine love that moves in me and in every molecule of the cosmos. I know the divine intelligence that is the foundation of all of this is or ever will be. I am one with all. Thank you, Karen. So come back to this space and just take a breath. And let's move on to principle number two. I am. Human beings have a spark of divinity within them, the Christ spirit within. Their very essence is of God, and therefore they are also inherently good. Now, I remember the first time that I was in a Unity Church that I actually saw a christening of a young child. It was such a unique and different experience for me that I actually cried. Uh, it was an awareness that this baby was being blessed, not because it was coming from a place of something that was wrong with it or that it needed to be, uh, something needed to be washed away, an impurity or something like that, but really a christening of a baby is acknowledging the divinity that exists within them. And to actually see that and to celebrate is such a gift. In, in a few weeks, we're going to have a few people that are becoming new members of the church. And in a way, that ceremony, which I'll let you know when that is, uh, is if you haven't experienced a christening, I invite you to make sure that you're here for that celebration of the new members of the church because it is like a christening. It's an invitation to celebrate that divinity that each of us have within and that we're bringing forward in the world. So I also brought some pictures. See these sweet little angels? You can see the essence that within them. And I will even share that something that I've learned along the way, even with my own children, is that we can do our best to teach, but I've discovered that each child has their own soul journey. And I can do my best to share as a mother uh, the wisdom that I've learned, and yet each of our children have their own journey that they are on, and they need to open up in their own way to whatever spirit is to guide them. Another important area of this I think I've mentioned before is this space of, of birth. When we were born, there's this essence within us that is both ego and spirit. And ego kind of gets a bad rap, but I don't want it to be bad. I just want you to acknowledge that it's there, and it's something that helps us to grow. So when we're babies, the ego kind of takes the lead like this, and it moves us forward and in life because we have to grow and mature and develop. Well, spirit may get left behind, and eventually it may catch up 
And then you may be in this place, well, sometimes your ego leads and sometimes your spirit leads. It's one or the other. Well, if you keep doing your work, that growth of spiritual intelligence that I keep talking about, then eventually the spirit will take the lead. And the ego then becomes subservient to spirit. And it's the spirit that leads your way and is really the best for yourself and the best for really for the world. So I can't move on from this subject without mentioning Jesus and how he is perceived in unity. He really is an example of that Christ consciousness that exists within each one of us that we see within the babies. He, is, he was a teacher and is a teacher today. He's fully human and fully God's self, 100% connected to the source of the universe. And he also said that we are fully capable of being that God in expression as well, as long as we look within, for the right, in the right place. So he said, this is from Matthew 10, Jesus was speaking to the 10 to 12 disciples, and he instructed them to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, he said, as you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, in metaphysical terms, Israel refers to those striving for God. So he was telling the disciples to go tell the innocent people or the sheep to look within. That would be very near indeed. Not here, but here. So let's breathe into the idea that I am God. Do you believe that? Can you own that? As I turn within, I retreat from outer awareness and enter my soul, the divine within me. It is here that I know my connections to spirit. Deep within, I find the peace that passes understanding. Deep within, I find the knowledge of all things and the awareness of absolute good. Deep within, I touch the gifts that are God. It is here that I receive wisdom and guidance, that I know truth and understanding, that I am strengthened and comforted. This is the essence that I am. The core of me is God. And from the God within me, I can do anything. Principle number three. Human beings create their experience by the activity of thinking. Everything in the manifest realm has its beginning in thought. So our thoughts, feelings, and beliefs have the power to create a reality. This is so important. This is really the most, maybe the most important principle of all. We are co-creating with God. This is universal law. It works for everyone, even if you don't realize the spiritual connection. So it was Buddha that said, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. If a man speaks or acts with evil thought, pain follows him. If a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him, like a shadow that never leaves him. This is why in Unity we talk so much about being positive, because we're focusing our energy on where we want to go and what we want to create in the world. So awareness is important because both consciousness and con unconsciousness can manifest. And I would even share with you that recently there's been a, um, some studies in science that have, people are focusing on, does the thought come first or the feeling come first? And I would say Charles Fillmore certainly thought it was the thought. But science is showing that maybe some of our brains work differently and that for some people the feelings may be more present first. It doesn't really matter which is first as long as we're aware. And the bottom line is can you, the, the vibrational feeling of creation comes from that feeling. So if you're not feeling it, it's not likely to manifest. You know, in our feasting and fasting book that I handed out uh, a few weeks ago, you know, we're actually practicing with this book. One week we're saying, I fast from complaining. I'm not going to focus on that. And the next week I say, I feast on appreciation. You know, I'm making a choice. That's direction on where I want my energy to go. So this is a powerful work in unity, and I've had several people share with me that they have really gotten a lot out of this book, so I'm glad you're enjoying it. If you haven't read it, um, pick it up in any moment you can start it to read it, and there will be a shift of energy each couple of days as you shift your energy from what's not working to what will. I'll even take a line from the 12-step programs. It says, you know, if it, wor it works if you work it. When we're talking about spirituality, Reverend Ellen is asking a lot of questions on her book. That's an important thing to do when we're on that spiritual path. 
She says, how can you tell whether we're on the right track or living in alignment with our desires? Sometimes we feel like this little guy on the path, even when we're adults and we're like, you know, which way is the way to go? She says, well, if it feels good, that's what you need to follow. Our emotions are a guidance system to steer us toward our highest good and our best at all times. And I was rather surprised to find out you know, I was aware that people were chanting in certain religions, like the monks would, would go to the monastery and chant, but I didn't understand what that was about until I understood the power of vibration. And they chant for hours. I'm like, well, why would someone chant for that long? That's how long it takes for that vibration to raise to that high level of creation. That's what they're seeking. fully divine and fully human as Jesus was. I am on earth to express God as me, a part of spirit in its infinite variations. I am free and unlimited, the creator of my experience. What I believe comes to me, what I want is already mine. What I perceive becomes real. What I know is the playfulness and creativity that I recognize as God's image in me. We are co-creating together my life, this world, all that is. I play a part, I have a role, and the universe would not be complete without me. The future is mine to design. Bring yourself back into this space and let's go to principle number four. I pray. Prayer is creative thinking that heightens the connection with God mind and therefore brings forth wisdom, healing, prosperity, and everything good. So learning how to pray for me in an affirmative way was really revolutionary. You know, I, I didn't really like the concept of prayer because I, when I was a younger person, I thought it was sort of begging for stuff. And when I understood what affirm, affirmation is, it really just opened up the whole world. I understood that it was connected, connected to my own energy and creating that vibration that I want to put forward in the universe. Prayer is the power of the thinking mind. And Jesus said, ask and it will be given. So Reverend Ellen says that asking is focusing our thoughts and aiming our intentions. Prayer is the time that we take to focus and to align ourselves with the oneness, with the divine and, the, and to affirm that whatever we need is already ours right here and right now. When you pray, can you really be in that vibrational feeling that it is here? Before ministerial school, I'll share with you that I spent a number of months praying with people at Silent Unity. We would answer phones and people would make prayer requests. This is, I gotta be honest, this is something I never thought I would do. And somehow spirit put me in that place. And what a blessing it was. I actually got to pray with people thousands of miles away on the other side of the world. And what was most interesting to me is normally people were kind of, Quite often people were at low energy when they would call in, and they would be asking for that affirmation for someone to help them with that. So in this prayer process, it would be three to five minutes. I could actually feel the shift of energy like halfway through, two and a half minutes of when there is this shift of energy where the person on the other side of the phone line feels the shift within themselves. And I could feel that on the phone, even though they were thousands of miles away. So I actually asked uh, Chaplain Joanne to give us an example of an affirmative prayer. I want to make sure that everybody understands what this likes, what is what this is like. And I actually designed this prayer. Imagine that someone has asked for a prayer of forgiveness. Joanne. Centered in God's holy presence, we turn away from thoughts of the world around us. We let go of all concerns and allow God's peace and love to fill our awareness. Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. As I forgive, rivers of divine love flow through me and peace washes over me. As I forgive, I accept myself and others just as they are. I dedicate this moment of my life as a time of complete forgiveness. The unifying power of God's love flows through me to all people in my life. 
I choose to see the good within each person and every circumstance. I radiate peace, harmony, and goodwill to others, and in return, I am blessed. Thank you, God, for the abundant good, good now flowing forth to meet my every good. Amen. So in unity, not only do we pray with affirmative words, but we also connect with the sacred place of silence. In the book Lessons in Truth, Emily Cady called this the secret place of the Most High. I love that reference to how she describes this. She says, it is a secret place because it is a place of meeting between the Christ at the center of your being and your consciousness, a hidden place into which no outside person can either induct you or enter himself. We must drop the idea that this place of realization of our divinity can be given to us by any human being. No one can come into it from outside. The light that you so crave will come out of the deep silence and become manifest to you from within yourself if you will, if you will keep still and look for it from that source. I would share with you that the practice of daily meditation is also probably one of the biggest shifts that I've experienced in my life, and it's not difficult to start. All you have to do is sit for five minutes each day, feet planted on the, fl the floor, arms open, receptive, and breathe and listen to your breath. That's all that's required to get started. And once you do five minutes, you can add a, every day, you can add another five minutes and see where it goes. In the stillness of my heart, I turn to God within. In my heart, I know my oneness with the divine. In my heart, I fear nothing, want nothing, lack nothing. In my heart, I rest in the awareness of God's unyielding presence, and I take pleasure in our communion. My soul is the divine, my higher self is my access to God, the Christ in me. I am an opening for God on the earth, and I let divine light and love flow through me into the world. I surrender to this knowing, to this purpose, and to the blessings that flood my being as I allow this flow of spirit in and through me. Principle number five, knowing and understanding the laws of life, also called truth, are not enough. A person must also live the truth that he or she knows. So it's interesting to know that the first four principles are actually about shifting our consciousness before we see that changing behavior in the world. With principle number five, we're turning it, this into a type of action, which is about expressing God through us at all times. And living this truth is more about being than actually doing. So for each of us, it may look different. Ellen Devonport says that any action that feels forced, impulsive, or emotional is not likely to be principle. She says acting, oh, she encourages to follow our star. She says, acting in principle usually brings a reassuring sense of being on the right track, even if others object. It is not stubbornly exerting your will, but it might be moving to the beat of your own drummer or following your own star. Now in this process, she makes a distinction between an authentic action and activism in today's world. So I would I suggest as, you, as you're out in the world, look at your own energy. Are you acting against something or are you for something? So here are some examples, some pictures in the, would be your left side. A woman is act, inactive, she is actually at a march against, like, um, against war. She doesn't want war to be in the world. So the energy is all against. But what is that really creating? Really nothing, only the fact that she's against. And the other picture is really a rally to demonstrate peace. And so they're actually for something. They're moving towards peace. So which one of these pictures, which one of these rallies would you want to be in? Just think about it. Yeah. We're saying the peace one looks much better. It's a much better match for us. So often, uh, before the metaphysical um, action will occur, there will be this shift in consciousness before we will actually see the physical result in the world. And I have examples of that as well. One of these pictures is the knocking down of the Berlin Wall. I remember watching that on television years ago, and I was just 
flabbergasted, amazed that this was going on. All of a sudden, after all these years, people were picking up sledgehammers and knocking it down. And I had to think, you know, why, why now? Why all of a sudden? And then there's also people that are advocating for saving the whales and other people advocating for being green in our community in many ways, saving trees and saving prairie lands. Those are great examples. What most excite me, excite, excites me about this idea is the fact that scientific studies are showing that if you have just 10% of the energy um, that if you can get 10% of, of the people believing the same thing, that that 10% is the, the cusp that takes it over the edge. You know, I would have thought it had been more like 60% to make something like the Berlin, Berlin Wall come down. Science is showing just 10%. If you can get that high vibration at 10%, then you can make that change happen. And it will happen immediately. So when practicing principle five and living the truth that we know, this often puts us into a place of service in the world. Reverend Ellen says that this type of service is not about being subservient, and it's not anything like being a chore. She definitely says that this is about being in sacred service. In the, in this, being in sacred service is the divine in us, touching the divine in another person. And when you know that when you're in service this way, there's no feeling of lack. No feeling of lack in you and no feeling in lack in the other person that, that might be receiving. Abundance all around. In fact, I heard so much conversation about the Link Luncheon event recently. I'm pretty sure that the people here that were uh, participating in that felt that space of the divine. What is mine to do? How am I to serve? I have come to this human experience not just for myself but for others, and I stand ready to share God's love with them. The love expresses through me and as me. I make myself ready. I ask for my perfect place of service. I live the truth knowing that God is all, that I am God, that we are co-creators and that I am never separate from divine radiance. I let my light shine to illuminate those in darkness. I let my heart expand for those who need love. I give as it has been given to me, and I'm grateful for, all, for us all. Thank you. So that's the five principles, but I'm not done yet. I want to share just a little bit more. I want to connect this to something else that I've taught here before, but I'll share it very quickly and then make it a connection. This is about what's called the three faces of God. And the reason this is so important is that we need to find a way to language what it is that we're talking about when we talk about spirituality. And we're aware that all over the world, people relate to spirit, to God, in three different ways. The first way is it. We call this the infinite face of God. So basically, this is the great web of life, this energy field that we've been talking about. The next one is thou. It's the intimate face of God. And so that intimate face is where we are really connected with the other like a beloved. And then the third one is the inner face of God. That's where we actually become God ourselves. So it was a great shift in my own awareness in making sense of spirit when I understood exactly what was going on when I connected this idea of the three. I'll list them here, starting with infinite God, which is the, out here, the beloved, I can say is here, you're in connection with something else, like, almost like a person type, and then here is God inside. There was a great shift when I realized how the principles relate to this concept and how unity has come to be where it is today. So really, I'll need your attention to pay attention to this. So the first one is infinite God. So this is principle one. Again, we're talking about God is everywhere. God is energy. And then principle two is our inner God. That spark of divinity is within us. So unity completely celebrates those two concepts. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. Oftentimes, I become aware in unity that people come in here from other faiths, 
perhaps the Catholic Church, perhaps another Protestant church, um, or conservative Christianity. Many times when they come from that environment, they are really focused on the middle one, the intimate God. And many times, and that's like their only expression of, of their connection with God. And many times it may, they even may, may feel helpless, like it's not a powerful connection, it's not a, a, something that empowers them. So I've noticed that when people come into unity, they kind of have to let that second one go for a while, and they tend to dive in to principle one and two and start to connect in different ways. Unity is very strong in our language in uh, principle one and two, the universal God and the God that's within us. And then lo and behold what happens, we get to principle three where we're co-creating. And I really think that that includes all different aspects of spirit. So people can really come into understanding and appreciating God in a new way that's empowering and when in fact their history may have not been so empowering before. And then also principle four, it covers all three of these areas as well, and so does principle five. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is because of the Energy of Money series. I had someone tell me, you know, I've been coming here for quite a while, but you really don't talk about God very much. And I was really rather surprised by that. I'm like, I talk about God every time I'm here. What do you mean by that? And I don't always say the word God. And you know why that is? It's because God to me, that word, is really more the intimate God, the second one. When I say the word spirit, I'm really talking about all three. It's, so it's so important that we clarify our language and what it is exactly that we mean. So as I close today, I want to share a quote from Eric Butterworth from the book called In the Flow of Life. If you've never read it, I highly recommend it. He says, dwell much on this concept that life is lived from inside out, and that you are a dynamic center in the creative flow, which is God, and that you have a built-in capacity for health and success. You can be more, you can do more, and you can have more in life because you are inexorably linked to the transcendent flow of life. God bless. I hope that you will really dive into the principles if you don't know much about them. They really have been a transformative force in my own life. Thank you.